Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. Currently, I serve on the MS Society's Community Review of MS Research Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering those questions and connecting you to resources. Vision problems are very often the very first sign of MS. Fortunately, the prognosis for MS-related vision issues is often positive. Joining me to share strategies for navigating MS-related vision issues and provide guidance for managing and optimizing your vision is Dr. Shiv Saida. Dr. Saida is a professor of neurology in the Division of Neuroimmunology and Neurological Infections at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Saida maintains a commercial relationship with Genentech, Biogen, Novartis, Lapix Therapeutics, Junebrain, Celgene, PG Therapeutics, Rewind Therapeutics, Kinixa Therapeutics, and InnoCare Pharma. Welcome, Dr. Saida, and thanks for being with us today. I hope you'll get us started by explaining some of the most common vision issues that individuals with MS might face. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I mean, I think I think as you pointed out, um, visual problems are, are a common initial manifestation of MS. So very commonly, uh, inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, which we refer to as optic neuritis, um, and that's the nerve that basically carries signals from the eye uh, to through the brain, but uh, all the way to the through various pathways uh, to the back of the brain where the visual centers sit. Um, that can become inflamed as part of the MS disease process. And so optic neuritis is the initial manifestation of, uh, of MS in, in about 25% uh, of people um, and occurs in, it occurs in up to 50% of people um, at some point uh, at various different points during the disease course. And so the symptoms of optic neuritis are uh, often uh, visual blurring or impairment in, in an eye. Um, there's frequently uh, uh, associated pain uh, with eye movements. Um, and then very frequently, there is a kind of a breakdown in, in, in color vision, uh, differentiating uh, kind of like bright and darker colors from one another. Um, and like you pointed out, uh, although the it can be very scary and the visual impairment can be very marked uh, at the beginning, uh, frequently the visual recovery is actually uh, very, very good. Now, the caveat to that statement is that the visual recovery is typically very good at what we call uh, regular or high contrast vision. So um, at low contrast vision, which kind of refers to our ability to see things when the background illumination is not so good. So like, a, a, for example, in the evening time or at nighttime, or basically when the background is darker, uh, the visual recovery is not always as excellent. Um, and so the, the kind of degree of involvement uh, of the optic nerve and the degree to which recovery occurs varies, although generally the prognosis is actually quite good. Um, I think probably the one of the most important things is to consider when somebody presents for the very first time with what we deem to be symptoms consistent with an optic neuritis event, uh, that a condition like MS, as part of which it's frequently observed, uh, is is strongly considered. Now, it's not just optic neuritis, right? Um, so I, I will say that although optic neuritis occurs very frequently in the clinical syndrome, involvement of the optic nerve itself, which I'm going to refer to as optic neuropathy, um, is 
virtually ubiquitous as part of the MS disease process. So you say, well, what does virtually ubiquitous mean? Well, um, there have been post-mortem studies done that show that at time of death, regardless of whether somebody ever had an optic neuritis event, uh, that up to 99% of people with MS actually have got uh, plaques um, within their optic nerve. And obviously plaques are those areas of scar tissue where the immune system has been attacking that myelin or insulation sheet around um, the wires or cables that nerve cells use to kind of communicate and speak with one another. And that can manifest itself with, in a much more insidious may, way. So rather than, you know, producing this of kind of like quick onset of visual impairment, there can be like some gradual or mild affliction of the visual system. Now, apart from difficulty with vision itself, I think another common uh, way that MS can affect uh, vision is through uh, the nerves that actually uh, innervate the muscles that control eye movements. And so sometimes people with MS uh, will have difficulty with specific eye movements. And rather than having visual blurring, we'll often have double vision as the kind of clinical manifestation of that. Why is early detection important in addressing <clears throat> vision problems and preserving visual function for people living with MS? Yeah. I mean, I think that we could, we could almost have, take the word vision out of that statement and apply it to anything, right? I mean, we could apply right. it to sensory function, motor function, bowel and bladder function. I think the, the, um, one of the things that we're very aware of, and, and obviously there's a very strong kind of, you know, scientific literature to support this, is that earlier uh, diagnosis of MS um, and the earlier institution of appropriate treatment for a particular person with MS uh, imparts the uh, best kind of possible outcome in terms of uh, reducing the likelihood of disability accumulation over time. So I think really a lot of this has got to do with um, kind of trying to optimize the way that we just manage MS in general, which currently, uh, although we're good, we've gotten better and, and we're good, we're still not fully there, right? I mean, currently one of our key goals in, in the clinic space is to try to reduce new kind of inflammatory activity, um, basically focal inflammatory activity, uh, by either modulating or suppressing the immune system with our various different uh, treatments that we have available in an effort to try to keep people the way that they are, or try to maximize their current state of health. Of course, being very forward facing, it would be nice to have therapeutic options that are also aimed at for example, improvement, right? And 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 that are not just immune based. Um, and, and hopefully, I think that that is something that uh, we can look forward to in the future. I think you're right. Um, which brings me to my next question. We've heard from Sandra, who tells us she's been experiencing difficulties with her vision because of her MS. And she wants to know if her risk of experiencing more vision problems or losing her vision altogether is high and whether there's anything she can do to make those out outcomes less likely. Yeah. So I think uh, there's a few kind of uh, things that I would point out. If the visual uh, recover, and, and obviously I said this at the beginning, that the visual uh, kind of recovery tends to be pretty good uh, from an optic neuritis event among people with MS. Now, it can it can result in in severe visual impairment and poor recovery. But I would say that in somebody who has an optic neuritis event and the recovery is very poor, it's also very important on the clinical side to consider that we've actually gotten the diagnosis correct because there are a number of other conditions that are related to MS, but they're not MS. And so uh, one condition, for example, is called neuromyelitis optica or NMO spectrum disorder. Another one uh, is called uh, MOG-associated disease. MOG stands for myel myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. Um, I think really what I'm trying to point out here is, hey, you know what? Although there's this kind of like association between optic neuritis and MS, MS is not the only cause, cause of optic neuritis. And if it's a very severe case of optic neuritis with very poor visual function and recovery, it's also very important to consider other diagnoses. Um, just in terms of, and I and this is something that I talk to um, patients in uh, who see me in clinic about. Apart from the the kind of therapeutic treatments that we have available, 
which are primarily aimed at, right, we said, like I said, modulating or suppressing the immune system. It would be great to have neuroprotective and, and, you know, kind of reparative approaches. And while we may not have therapies, I do think that there are lifestyle factors that are extremely important. And I think this, again, can be applied beyond the visual system. And so I really spend a lot of time talking about the role and benefit of diet and exercise. I mean, when we look at the data for, for example, a Mediterranean style diet, um, it's been shown that people who follow a Mediterranean style diet who don't have MS have got higher brain volumes, higher cognitive function, um, higher energy levels, improved better mood. And then when it's looked at in an MS, it seems to be associated with improved outcomes as well. Similarly, um, from, you know, exercise is probably our in, within our wheelhouse, our current kind of most potent neuroprotective and reparative approach that is available. Um, it's kind of fascinating because, you, you know, as always, we were, all, were kind of taught when you're medical students. Unfortunately, I haven't been a medical student for quite some time. But what, 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 what we were taught is that there's very little kind of regenerative capacity within the central nervous system. And by that, I'm referring to kind of brain and spinal cord. But when you, <clears throat> when you actually look at um, and you can radio label nerve cells uh, in in mice. And when you make them run on a rotor wheel, in a dose response to the amount of running that they do, you actually see a greater amount of new nerve cell development, particularly within the kind of um, the kind of hippocampal regions uh, of their brains. Um, and then there's been some, in people, there's been some spinal fluid biomarkers that have actually been shown to be associated with uh, with uh, an increase, uh, again, in a dose response to exercise. And I just want to borrow some literature from that's not from MS. When you actually look at, at data uh, for the role of exercise in dementia, which is a truly neurodegenerative uh, uh, disorder, and of course, there's a number of different types of dementias. There's been a there was a wonderful study done in France where they showed that people who had mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre Alzheimer's disease uh, or pre dementia disease state, that the individuals who received the highest dose of combined uh, aerobic and anaerobic exercise actually re had a reduction in conversion from uh, this mild cognitive impairment to clinically definite dementia by about 40%. So Whenever we talk about preservation um, of, of, of neurological function and status, I think it's very important to say that we've got two different things. We have drugs and we have therapies that we use, but you just can't get away from the, the, the importance of the, the lifestyle factors. Of course, the other side of it is that any, and, and we're moving towards this, right? We're kind of interested in precision care. Um, and so we have kind of treatments that are kind of generally, you could bucket them as being kind of low, intermediate or high potency. And then you can kind of uh, kind of uh, tie that with risk. Right? And you could kind of say that risk associated with those treatments can either be low, medium or high. And it's often tied to the, to the degree of potency of the treatment. But... It is also about trying to take an individual person and assess what the state of their MS actually is. Now, of course, we're often doing this kind of like at, at cross-sectional time points, but then over time, we're, we're also getting a flavor for how things are, are changing over time or hopefully not changing. Um, and are trying to give somebody the best appropriate treatment, right? In an effort to try to reduce the risk of having further inflammatory events. So I think there's two things. If you've got had an event within the visual system, let's say an optic neuritis, of course you want to be on the best treatment for you based off of a number of different parameters. We can certainly explore that if we want to, to try to arrive at what's the best treatment you should be on. But on top of that, and there should also be kind of these lifestyle efforts to promote protection and potentially repair, which are fundamentally grounded principally in diet and exercise. And then there's a number of other things. I just, John, you know, <clears throat> it's been very, very clearly shown that people with MS who um, have poorly controlled blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, that their outcomes are worse over time. And it kind of makes sense, right? <clears throat> These are vascular risk factors. And 
you know, vascular disease occurs in, in the brain just as much as it occurs in other parts of the body, like in the heart, for example. And so vascular disease occurring in the brain of somebody with MS is kind of like throwing oil in on top of a fire, so to speak. And so it's really important to try to control the, those vascular comorbidities as much as possible. Um, weight is an important thing. And we know, for example, and I've actually done some studies looking at this, that e even if you're on higher potency treatments, the effectiveness of those treatments is not quite as good in the setting of a higher BMI. And I think one other thing that we know from the vascular realm is that MS patients, for example, who smoke have a two to three times higher relapse rate than MS patients that do not smoke. And so I, I, I think, you know, it's not just about a drug. It's kind of like a a holistic approach to this kind of this disease uh, to try to really kind of tackle it from as many different angles as possible. Francesca tells us that she thinks her vision issues are related to her MS, and she's wondering whether she still has to see an eye doctor, even though she's already seeing a neurologist to manage her MS. Yeah, good question. I mean, obviously, we shouldn't assume that what happens to somebody with MS is always related to their MS, right? This is a this is the caveat that we come across, and this is how general medical things often get missed. Um, and unfortunately, as we get older, um, we're all more prone to getting additional things, and that unfortunately also applies to people with MS too. Um, and so, as we age, we're at greater risk of cataracts, glaucoma. Uh, age-related macular degeneration. Um, and it, it is, I generally advise uh, people uh, with MS to have an annual healthy eye screen exam with, a, with an eye doctor at least once a year. I think that's following some of the other basic principles of, hey, you should see your PCP once a year, because again, like, you know, you meant to stay on top of like your general health and make sure you're getting your cancer screening done when you're meant to be. And, and again, within the context of some of the treatments, um, I think also like seeing a dermatologist, for example, once a year may be important too. William tells us he's wondering about what he can do to reduce his discomfort and prevent further damage to his vision while he waits for his doctor's appointment. Okay. Well, I mean, I I think so this, I'm going to have to bring this back to some some basic medical principles. We covered I think we covered actually a lot of the answer to that question just in terms of like what are the strategies you can do for like preserving you know not just vision but like nervous system integrity uh through diet and exercise. Um I I will say <clears throat> if somebody who has MS or is suspected to have MS is in a state of limbo, meaning that they're hanging out waiting for a doctor's appointment. If something happens and they're really concerned, then they, sh you know, I think it's really important to seek appropriate, like urgent medical care. Um, so if something is changing or something is occurring, um, I think that it's really important to actually try to like push to be either seen sooner and but also not to take chances or risks and to appropriately seek urgent or emergent medical care when it's necessary. Are there medications or therapies that minimize optic nerve damage in individuals with MS? And, and if there are, how effective are these interventions? Yeah. I mean, I think that this is this is again something a little bit similar to 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 what I kind of discussed. I think I don't know that any of this is specific, uh, you know, particularly for the visual system and optic nerve affliction per se in people with MS. Um, I think that we have you know we have treatments available that that some of which are excellent at reducing the risk of further new focal inflammatory activity. So for example, optic neuritis, um, as well as subclinical, uh, you know, um, you know, inflammatory events, right? Because not everything is associated with symptoms. Um, I, I think that a lot of the, the, and, th and this is like kind of very similar to like, if there's like, let's just say somebody has an episode of inflammation in their spinal cord as well, right? And they have difficulty walking afterwards. Um, we, we're, we really, 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 really want strategies for neuroprotection and repair. 
And of course, we don't have any treatments, but we do have lifestyle strategies. And I'm just going to keep, I'm going to be like a broken down record about this because, I, and, and I, I, I will, I'm going to give a, an example of, you know, what, of how important this lifestyle stuff is in my view and i and it's difficult to study by the way but i don't think that any any treatment that a person with ms is on is actually being given a its best opportunity to be optimized and work at its be, at its kind of like best level in the absence of kind of like general healthcare meaning like these general kind of lifestyle factors and my analogy is if somebody is the same as you know, if somebody has lung cancer and they're getting chemotherapy, but they're continuing to smoke, it, it's counterproductive. I feel like people with MS who are on excellent treatments, if they're not, if they're not managing their general health, I, I think it really does interfere with outcomes. Are there emerging treatments that might hold promise for improving visual outcomes for people living with MS? So I, yeah, I think that there are emerging treatments that may improve outcomes, not just for visual issues, but all issues, hopefully with people with MS, right? Um, and, and again, you know, I, I kind of just want to maybe broadly explain this, right? We've got one approach right now, right, that we that we employ, we either modulate or suppress the immune system. That that's the way that we kind of like try to modify the disease process. Of course, we have symptomatic treatments that we use to try and improve symptoms, but they're not modulating the disease process itself. The other two buckets, and I've said this, that we really kind of want to be able to target are, are we want to be able to target neurodegeneration. So that that requires neuroprotective therapies. And we want to be able to target the demyelination that's present, right? So the uh, the insufficient amounts of myelin, or sometimes no myelin, that uh, this insulation that's wrapped around the wires uh, or cables uh, that nerve cells are using to communicate. And so we want remyelinating therapies, right? Therapies to promote that. And the good news is that for both uh, neuroprotective, um, in other words, trying to keep things the way they are, and remyelinating, in other words, trying to make things better, there is a whole slew of treatments that have been developed and that um, that are either going into or have already started to go into uh, clinical trials. And so I'm really, really optimistic about the future of treatment, not just kind of targeting these immune mechanisms. I know you recently co-authored research on socioeconomic disparity and its association with faster retinal neurodegeneration in MS. What did you learn in conducting your research? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I think I think this is actually very much probably aligned with several of the statements and comments that I've been making up until now. Um, the 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 association between worse outcomes and and basically we were, we were not really looking so much at visual function but we were looking at something called OCT or optical coherence tomography uh, which is a kind of non-invasive imaging technique that allows us to measure nerves in the back of the eye um, this uh, was a, a study that was uh, was led by um, Kate Fitzgerald um, at, at our institute um, they basic kind of in a nutshell, people who are unfortunately more disadvantaged uh, from a socioeconomic status tend to have uh, worse outcomes. And actually, we also found, for example, that um, people who were more uh, disadvantaged socioeconomically, um, they were actually more likely to be escalated or moved to more potent disease modifying treatments as well. And to me, what this is a very kind of, it's almost like a non-specific thing. It's kind of like the BMI data, right? The body mass index data. People of, of higher BMI with MS tend to have faster rates of brain and retinal tissue loss over time who have MS. And, and I think it all comes back, uh, I suspect, kind of general healthcare factors, um, diet, exercise, control of comorbidities, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, blood sugars and diabetes, um, you know, smoking status. And th this, this, there's data in other countries, for example, as well, that show um, that, that, that this is relevant. Separate to that, 
you know, and I think there's a little, there can be sometimes a little bit of confusion about this. Separate to the socioeconomic status, race is obviously very important as well, right? I mean, we've previously, um, I've actually previously published a paper looking at, um, you know, we had about 115 uh, white Americans and 115 black Americans who we were tracking again with OCT at our center with this imaging technique. And what we found was that rates of uh, of retinal tissue loss as well as brain tissue loss over time was faster among our black patients. And it was regard it was kind of regardless of the um of the potency of treatments that they were on. So it's not all and actually there's some exp expansion studies that have been done that actually show um that it's not always an access thing that there even when people have similar access to to the health system that race is important sex is important uh, because men tend to do worse with ms or, uh, than women but then also socioeconomic status is important as well so there's there's a number of different factors that feed into outcomes well, you've shared some important information about how to best manage vision problems in MS today. Let me ask you, what would you say is your top takeaway that you'd like our viewers to remember? Yeah, I think my top, I think you probably can already predict what my top takeaway is. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm pretty consistent about this. I, I, I think that it's important, obviously, to try to get on the best treatment that makes sense from a risk benefit point of view to maximize the ability to prevent uh, further inflammatory events and tissue damage from occurring. But that in itself doesn't necessarily change what's already happened. And often when you get to that point or when a person gets to that point um, and they have any disability, they're they're obviously very keen to try to improve upon what's already there. And I think that's where lifestyle comes in. Diet, exercise, and looking after one's general uh, kind of like health overall. I, I think that's such a great takeaway because these are things people can do for themselves today. Doesn't require a prescription, doesn't require a pill, injection, or infusion. And as you've said, there's so much evidence that indicates it makes things better. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I will, I will say, and I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> you're very aware of this. But if you just, if you just move it, if we just, I know, of course, this is an MS, uh, uh, you know, focused uh, talk. But if we just park up MS for one minute and we just say, let's just look at disease in general in the developed world. Right. So Western countries, sadly, John, 75 percent of chronic conditions can probably be alleviated through lifestyle alone. But they represent the largest bucket of healthcare utilization in Western Europe and in the USA. Hmm. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us, Dr. Saida. I think we have time to answer one more question from our audience, and it's from Margarita who recently heard about Udoff's phenomenon and would like to know more about it. So maybe you can explain what Udoff's phenomenon is and how it relates to vision problems in MS. Oh, I love that question. Okay, so <clears throat> um, you know what? It's actually kind of interesting. Udoff's uh, essential, the way that we interpret it now is different to the way that it was originally interpreted, right? So I'll give you our current day interpretation of it. Our current day interpretation of it is that it's heat related uh, increases in MS symptoms, right? So what's the what's the mechanism of it? Um, we know, for example, that in MS, right, because of the attacks that have occurred, and hopefully there's no more attacks occurring because we have somebody on a good treatment and they're looking after themselves. Um, they, there is either no or insufficient amounts of myelin, right, around the nerve fibers or the nerve cables. And myelin as an insulation sheet is, it's one of its functions apart from subserving protection is to promote very smooth uh, conduction or movement of electrical signals or impulses, because that's how our, that's how nerve cells basically work, right? Um, and so when there isn't enough myelin there, or there's no myelin, that the type of conduction or the way that the signals uh, move, uh, they 
they change. The, the technical term is they actually move from what's called saltatory, so a jumping type of thing, to like membrane conduction. But the net effect is that everything slows down. So the, the speed of, of movement of signals slows down. If you take a normal nerve and you heat it up in the lab, the speed at which the signals move down that nerve slow down. So if things are already moving a little bit slowly and you heat up the nervous system, things will move even more slowly. And so what that does is that, is that it allows uh, symptoms to either come back, right? So recrudesce or existing symptoms to get worse. Um, and the way that we can heat up the nervous system is uh, one of two ways. You can either be out in the heat, which is actually not as, as effective at doing this uh, as the other way, which is actually physical activity, right? Because when you exercise or you undergo physical activity, it increases core body temperature. And so the symptoms such as the, let's just take the optic nerve as an example. Uh, sometimes people will have an ink, uh, will either have a return or an increase in visual blurring related to the heat. But then once they cool back down again, um, the speed at which the signals move through the nerves picks back up and the symptoms go back down. Um, the original description was by a German neurologist. His name was Uthoff. And it was actually in, in young women. That was This was the original description around the time of menstruation. Um, and that around the time of menstruation that they would, that people, that some of these younger patients with MS would have an increase in the experience of their MS symptoms. And possibly it's related to hormonal changes at the time of menstruation, which increases core body temperature. So obviously our current day description of it and utilization of it is a little bit different to the way that it was originally described by the, by the German neurologist. Well, I want to thank everyone who submitted some great questions today. And thank you, Dr. Saida, for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for the great questions. It's been a real pleasure. Before we close, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. For information and resources on MS, please be sure to visit the Society's website. You'll find research updates and news, information on connection programs like self-help groups and MS Friends, ways to get involved, and you'll hear about upcoming events that are taking place near you. Remember, you can connect with the National MS Society and others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I hope you'll join me every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, where I continue the conversation that we start here. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'd like to thank Dr. Sida for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webcast will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you'll join us at this same time for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to a survey pinned to the comments section. On YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. And on Twitch, you can find that link in the chat. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Shiv Saida and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.